Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Here are your hosts, Timothy and Renee. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Renee Coronado, and with me today, as always, it's Tim Muirhead. Hey, Tim. Hey, Renee. I'm doing very, very well today because we get to talk to one of our all time heroes. It's pretty awesome. Skip Livesey. Th- this dude is my hero. He's the Coen Brothers' main guy. So, No Country for Old Men, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? He's also done Gravity, which sent my wife into labor. Um, I mean, He's he's done all of the films that I that I absolutely love. I mean, if you look at the top five films of of my personal rankings, Skip shows up repeatedly, um, and so I'm I'm utterly jealous that you got to go and talk to him. Yeah, I got to go in person to talk to him, which was pretty cool. Uh, through various connections that we've made through doing Tone Benders, uh, I got his phone number, and I phoned him. And I just assumed that I'd get an answering machine and I had all like set up my spiel to say, you know, it would be really good if you did this. And then after the first ring, hello. And I was actually talking to Skip and I nearly crapped my pants, to be honest with you. It was weird. Yeah, I would have frozen up. Yeah, I, I froze. <laughs> I was like, hey, who, 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 Anyway, so I got stammered enough for him to uh, agree to do the interview. And uh, Teresa Morrow, uh, our sometimes co-host on this show, uh, she came down to New York City with me and we went to uh, Warner Brothers Sound, which is where Skip mainly works out of now in New York. And uh, we met him there and we sat down in his edit suite, which uh, is a really awesome edit suite because one wall is just covered with awards that he's won, which uh, <laughs> is not something that everybody has, a wall of awards in their edit suite. So that was pretty cool. You're using your awards as just sound treatment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cuts down on the low end. <laughs> uh, so he was really great. He sat down with us. But the, the interesting thing about this interview uh, is that his dog, Dave, sat in his lap the entire time during the interview. So throughout this uh, conversation that I have with uh, Skip, you can hear his dog panting and his dog's stomach rumbling. <laughs> and every once in a while, his dog kind of licks the microphone. So we've edited out as much of that as we can, but uh, you'll definitely hear evidence of Dave in there still. So uh, get ready for some doggy sounds. Well, we've been sitting on this interview for way too long, so it's time to release it to the world. Yeah, I've been sitting on it because uh, it was like a weird starstruck moment for me because... When I was in film school, I went to film school. To, I thought I was going to be a director, as I think everybody does. And then uh, I started learning about sound for film and started really liking it. And a bunch of us went out to a repertory cinema to see Miller's Crossing. Have you seen Miller's Crossing, Renee? I have not. Okay, it's one of the Coen Brothers' earlier films, and the sound in it is amazing. Like, it's not like an action film, but the sound is like a character in the film it sets a mood for it and it was one of the first times that because i was studying sound for the first time for film we went and saw this it was one of the first times that i really kind of slapped me in the face with like sound is what is making this movie so ominous and tense and uh that was one of the reasons that i kind of ditched the whole director idea and went full on into sound for film wow and uh skip is uh one of the main reasons for that because of the work that he's done over the years so I was definitely uh, feeling overwhelmed being in his presence, which is weird because he's a super laid back. As you'll hear in the interview, he kind of talks slowly and he's very laid back and very approachable. But I built him up in my head as this like God amongst sound people. But luckily, Dave was there to keep the levity involved and uh, knock us on our asses every time we got (laughs) hoity-toity. But uh, yeah, so the first question that I asked him was something that I think Skip is really known for, is that he knows how to find the sound of a film and really uh, sculpt the sound to be not just the soundtrack of the film, but a, a character in the film. And I asked him how he goes about finding that. Let's check it out. I do think that the, each movie has its own sound, and it, the job really is to help the filmmaker get the movie done, right? Get to the finish line. Usually, that involves a lot of like um, kind of methodical number crunching type stuff. But there's always something which is hanging out there. M- most of the films I work on, people have are chasing at some kind of a thing, whether it's a deeply uh, ingrained like dream idea or it's just something that isn't working yet there's always like basically why get me if someone else moves much cheaper could do it more quickly (laughs) so i get i definitely get assignments you know and one of the things we found out uh over the years is that's really all that matters on a lot of movies and 
So we always try to do that, deal with that right away. With that in mind, it doesn't take long for you to figure out that's the only thing that really matters. And so we basically have a, have a kind of general approach where we always try to deal with that first and everything else is a subset of that. It's either, it's either a function of or greatly less important than that thing, whatever it is. And um, it's, it's exciting and rewarding and, and frustrating and, you know, annoying, but it is really, that's the core. And sometimes it's like, oh, on this movie, we're not going to use any ADR. Or, oh, on this movie, we're only going to use ADR and none of the production. I worked on a project in Spain, which was almost entirely looped. And I had never worked on a project where there wasn't, you know, a foundation or production track of some kind. Usually it's 90%, yeah. right? So here was a movie where, like, there wasn't any production track. And the very first thing that we did was, well, let's put all the production track back. Let's get all the production track and try to find... If there's anything usable, first off, whatever stuff is salvageable, and maybe that'll lead us to optional things like some production sound effects from other takes or from setup, close-ups, wide, etc. And then we actually found a fair amount of usable production dialogue, and the editor was sort of discouraging at first, and then finally said, "Oh, hey, that sounds fine. Let's just use that." There's a thing which in California is called the safari loop okay back in the day we would make 35 millimeter loops of stuff right so if you went into a the machine room on a dub stage in like let's say the 80s or 90s there was a whole contraption of loops traveling around the room it was kind of crazy right and it would be crickets or birds or whatever stuff was happening or something that you took from one take and you were filling out you know something was missing in your production and there was a technique where you could record to quarter-inch tape, and then you could splice that together in a loop of quarter-inch tape. And they actually had a little tiny rewind with the head that you could listen to and make a splice. And you would load it into this cart, and um, you could pop that in. You could keep a whole. And, and most of the stages had these racks of these carts. And one of them was quite famous because it had all sorts of stuff in it. If you had ADR, you could pop that in and use a little bit of this, just noise, just mm -hmm. a bunch of noise. And that tape was labeled Safari okay. for some reason. So it became kind of like, can I hear, give me Safari loop on 12 was, everyone had a Safari loop, everyone had like noise, or you make one from the show and you would just put it in and just wag it in there underneath your a dry ADR, mm -hmm. particularly on TV shows, I'm told. Mm -hmm. So I, got, I thought that was hilarious when we, we started calling everything became a safari loop. And so we, we started working on the reverse safari project, which is as we're working on the movie, we would take copy production sounds, usually like doors and things that could be recycled, which were somewhat distinctive. <laughs> And then a lot of times there's just weird stuff like, you know, wild track of a train or, or a, a dog wheezing or something <laughs> like that. So we started compiling what we call the, the safari loop. And so I took that with me to Spain and we started hosing. We started grabbing stuff out of this. There's a lot of stuff. It's not very well sorted, but there's a ton of like movement and noise and room tone and that sort of stuff. And we started hosing this into this movie that we saw looped. And eventually we, we made a essentially a production track for the whole movie with from the Safari Loop. It was like the it was like the ultimate Safari Loop adventure, basically. That was the thing that that movie needed. You know, coincidence is at best is how that evolved. It wasn't exactly an engineering uh, feat. And that's that's the way it I think it just takes um, more than anything, you just got to listen to what you're being asked. Listen to the question, and then the answer comes from that. Well, I was working on this movie, The New World, with Terry Malick's The New World, and uh, my coworker Joel, who was from San Francisco, had learned the whole San Francisco vibe. 
you know, and, and uh, Terry told me at one point he wanted me to take out this this line, and because it was cheated and it didn't, it wasn't sync wasn't good, and I said, well, let me work on that. And the first thing I did was I took the whole line and I made it longer, and then I was able to recut internally the syllables and make it fit better. And Joel was watching me, and Joel was like. You made it longer so you could make it shorter. Fuck. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> he said, where are you get? how do you get that? How, how did you know to do that? And I'm, to me, I didn't, wasn't even really thinking of it. It wasn't like something I'd done a lot. It wasn't like, oh yeah, let me get the make it longer, make it shorter trick. Just at the moment it seemed, as I was watching the picture which didn't match the sound, this is too long, so I've got to shorten that, and I thought, I'll just make it longer, and that way it'll be easier to cut. So it's kind of an intuitive approach, mm -hmm. like everything, since I didn't go to school. I didn't have, I'm not fighting formal training, so yeah. all I have to go on is intuition, really. I think that's, you know, the, my big takeaway, takeaway always is just listen to the question, and the answer's already coded in there. A lot of times it's like the unwanted, the horrible answer is really the only answer. Nobody wants to do that, but that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. The reason why we always like the work on the hard thing first is because it, it simplifies the job so much. Because mm -hmm. it almost always reveals all the other, you know, answers. I'm thinking of the Miles Davis movie that I worked on recently, Miles Ahead. Don Cheadle, but he'd never made a film. And he was terrified of taking on the project because it would be hard enough just to be Miles Davis. Yeah. And then he had to be the filmmaker as well. But eventually, everyone said, no, this is your project. You've got to do this. And he said, OK. So um, they said, we, we want to talk about sound design. So I'm like, OK. So they showed me some scenes. And it's a pretty abstract movie, but it doesn't really say sound design to me but oh yeah we need some sound design. no that was clearly the big problem it's like what do they really mean by that what's it going to be and my coworker and i worked on a bunch of stuff and we made a bunch of sound design -y type stuff none of which really seemed to fit very well but the man says give me some sound design give we're going to make sound some sound design, design. <laughs> so he said well, well can we come up and take a look and he said sure so they were sitting right here and i was playing this stuff and we got to this section where and Miles goes into this elevator and at a certain point he pushes the, the back of the elevator like a door and it opens up and he walks into this past. It's not a flashback but it's like the movie's going back in time to the, the glory days 5960 when he was super productive as that Miles. So it was supposed to be a, like a time travel almost. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the movie, I'm not looking at them, and I, but I could feel behind me this, like, horror. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, um, <clears throat> amazement. And so I turned around, I stopped the machine, I turned around, and they were like, uh, what is that supposed to be? <laughs> and I'm like, right, okay. So, like, when you said sound design here, what did you mean? And the picture editor, John, said, um, well, you know, footsteps. And uh, you know, so I'm like, oh, okay, okay. got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Don was really great about it. He was a fantastic guy, very generous and, and uh, sincere artist. He said, well, what other stuff did you make? <laughs> so we had made stuff throughout the movie for all the scenes in the movie that were kind of abstract. We made cool sounds for it. And he, I showed him a few of them. He's like, wow, okay. Miles would love this, but <laughs> I don't know what to make of it. So he said, all right, well, in the spirit of Miles, we got to let's carry this stuff and let's try to put it in the movie wherever we can. But we used a little bit of it survived in the movie, but it was really interesting how one man's footstep is another man's <laughs> sound design. <laughs> like I said to, to Don, you, it's always better to go too far, too far and come back sure. than mm -hmm. to, to not to to live with did we go far enough and not know. Uh, gravity was all about that. 
We did these huge experiments, giant. What, what if we did this? What if we did that? And a lot of it is in the movie. Um, but some things were like, yeah, it went too far. Well, the whole, you know, in space there's no sound. So we took, we, tr we try to comply with that through the whole movie. And of course the sound people had made, big spaceship sounds, you know, what if we tried, okay, Alfonso would say, okay, what do you got here? The usual rumble, blast, explosion, et cetera. What if we use some of that? What if we use just on this shot? What if we, you know, mix it up just for the sake of mixing it up? And that was, that's such a great experiment which it leads me to another whole separate part of it, which is the enabling idea of computers. So you can make those experiments quickly and deeply and profoundly, and then you can, you can come back or you can abandon or you can mix and match a little bit. That, that's the, the one great thing, one of the great things about, <laughs> about computer, the computer invasion in the sound world. You know, if you, if you look at the things that we do in Pro Tools, it's, it's all basically based on tape mm -hmm. and mag. So in a way, I don't miss it because we're still doing it. <laughs> we just don't, not actually hand, physically handling it anymore. But I remember one time, um, we used to work with these um, synclaviers. Mm -hmm. So we used to do sound design on a digital workstation. I was working on this project with a sound editor who hadn't really dealt with any workstations. He was just a mag type kind of person. Even he was a sound effects editor, mostly, and a supervising sound editor. And they did that stuff in the movies he worked on. He just they they did it on mag. And uh, he was saying to me, you know, well, what about the workstation? Do it? Do you do you miss like, you know? And and he's doing this thing with his fingers like he's Italian, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, he was Italian. Uh, and I said, do I miss touching it? Is that what you're going for? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really miss that. And it, essentially, soon, not too long after that discussion, we had already had had this facility and we had already bought a bunch of sync labs and stuff and we had our own Foley stage in which we were doing straight to disc so we could cut it on disc and eventually we were popping everything over from one recorder to a digital player on the stage so that you could edit, do stuff to so we never look back. I, I, I've, I resist nostalgia for nostalgia's sake, for nostalgic reasons. I'm perfectly happy to look back and wish that I had worked on 400 blows, you know, or something like that. But I don't miss stuff that works as good or better now. I mean, it's really easy to make stuff now. That I would say the thing I miss most about film is that the army of people that we used to have to have to get it done. That was fun. It was exciting to have a literal army working on the project. I, I don't miss the, um, I don't miss anything about MAG, really. I, I used to, um, it was almost like a game to be able to listen to a sound and go somewhere else and listen to another sound and find, just from memorizing the sound, a place where you could make a cut. And of course on MAG you can't really put it back. You can't like just say, oh that wasn't a good idea. You get, now you have, now both pieces of your MAG have a big splice in them, you have to deal with it. I think that there is there's some value there. I'm not really sure why it would be good to be. Um, what's it What's it hit intrinsically good about knowing how to make a loop <laughs> of a cricket background? <laughs> it's not really that important in today's world, mm -hmm. but <laughs> you learn that with with film. There's things that you learned and that were meaningful then. Yeah. Not so sure they mean that much anymore, but. You've had a really long working relationship with the Coen brothers. You've also had a long working relationship with several other directors. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about how you keep those relationships going. I got an award. It's right over there. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a career achievement award. And I, I know that they ex hoped and expected that Joel and Ethan Cohen would present the award at the show, which was, I think that's the reason why they gave me the award, basically. 
And I, they had asked several times in the past, and Jonathan always said no. And um, they said no this time as well. But they did actually send a, a, a statement, in, that which my friend Greg read at the show. And uh, they said, we're very um, um, gratified to learn that our choice for sound editor is as good as we always thought he was. But actually, we don't know, since we've never worked with anyone else, if he's any good or not. So I have that kind of a relationship with several filmmakers. So, I mean, I think the, the sincerity is really what people care most about. You know, they, they, they really do respond when you take their projects seriously and help them figure out, you know, the whatever jam, whatever conundrum there is. And... Um, I think, uh, you know, it's 90% luck and 10% uh, hard work and another 5% of um, right place, right time. And as my friend Jerry would say, I'd rather be lucky than good. And I think a lot of those things just apply. And I, I do really feel like lucky. I really felt like I was in the right place at the right time when I met the Cohen brothers. And Marty Scorsese, same thing. And most of the other work I got was because I worked with those two filmmakers. So I'm guilty of being lucky. I think being lucky and being sincere kind of go hand in hand. And at least for me in my career, they're, they're wedded. You might want to add taking it seriously, which I always did. I mean, I, I always felt really lucky to have this job. And I always felt like we used to have a, a one of my I had a business, uh, which we started in 1989, and we had a, some editing rooms and we had a Foley stage. And uh, we uh, quite consciously chose what we called the dumb method, where we would, we'd, rather than try to be smart, we would just try to be dumb and do a good job and charge a reasonable amount. And a lot of people respond to that, not everyone, but most people respond to that idea. and. It happened at the time that there were a lot of people who were smart. So there was a lot of... Uh, <laughs> there were a lot of abusive situations where people were getting paid a lot of money. We just tried to do a good job for a reasonable amount and not get rich. And we had this um, sort of a long view that if we got, had relationships with a few filmmakers, we could have a steady stream of work and then we could make some money. You started your career in New York, and then you moved to L.A. for many years, and now you're back in New York. Could you kind of compare and contrast what it's like working in those two cities? Around 15 years ago, we moved to California for fame and fortune. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually didn't think we would move back. I thought we'd be happy there. But it, both my kids moved back to New York as soon as they graduated school. And eventually my wife said, okay, it's time to go home and stop fooling around. <laughs> So we've been, uh, that transition happened about four years ago. And uh, New York does have, I would say, a deeper heritage of, um, of art and particularly uh, filmmaking as an art uh, is probably deeper and wider. And then if you go to LA, you have the comparison of art just kind of goes away. I mean, USC is like a business school basically and so is UCLA. And I think New York has always had that kind of, um, you know, it's a much more profound cosmopolitan city, much more European than Los Angeles, much older. And also the film business here is not the main occupation in town. Uh, money is. So uh, movies here naturally have more of a artistic uh, underpinning because Money is what's the business of this city, not film. Now, um, so the way I think for me, the way that uh, breaks down on a day-to-day -day basis is the movies in California were all mega. Everything there was much bigger. Every budget, every project was five, ten times more uh, wider, bigger, deeper. And... Certainly the facilities are the same applies, much bigger facilities and real estate being what it is in New York. I mean, 
land is free in Los Angeles by comparison. It's ridiculous. And, and actually, uh, I'll, if you look at the heritage of the migration from New York and New Jersey to Los Angeles, it's essentially a, a real estate idea. I mean, it, it, if, you're, if you want to raise cattle, you don't do that in a metropolitan area like New York. You do it out west where there's a lot of room to raise cattle. So if you think of uh, movies as herding people into theaters, it's, it's a pretty similar idea. The <laughs> I know for a fact that w I've worked places in Los Angeles where it is a real estate venture and that the studio lots are real estate capitalization, the, the facilities are rented back to the filmmakers, uh, the, stu the sound department pays rent to the over corporation, mm -hmm. and it's just plain old real estate. And you have the luxury there of having kind of purpose built from scratch, which is kind of fantastic, yeah. really, you know, that doesn't really exist. I guess probably like Chinatita, Pinewood, Twickenham, and in London, there's probably something in Paris, although Paris is much more urban in, in terms of where the film center is. And I, I've been in China recently and in Beijing, they built like a new film center like miles from town. And it's hilariously quaint, but also gigantic as well. And then in Shanghai, where, where we were, it's also urban. Uh, so it's more like Paris or it's more like Paris, actually. It looks like Paris, as it feels like Paris. It's kind of great. And there's a real sense of heritage. I mean, there's, there's like, uh, the film cinema is very important to the people. And uh, I was invited to go over uh, by the Dolby Corporation to talk about Atmos in uh, China. Just to talk about how we did gravity and how you can use Atmos. Atmos, it was happening, like when we mixed, um, the, the main mix of gravity was done in London in the winter of 2012. So we, we basically finished at the end of the year. Atmos wasn't really ready yet. There were a couple of projects which are, were being uh, sort of tweaked in Atmos and presented some parts or a, a whole sort of layer of Atmos, but there were very few theaters. Like yeah. a, most people haven't seen Gravity in Atmos because at the time, there were, I think there were only 40 theaters worldwide at that time. So uh, we waited. This, uh, the, the, actually, the plug-in wasn't working. So it, didn't, it wasn't working until the summer of 2013. And so the movie, even though we were finished at the end of the year, we, the movie didn't come out until October. So we just waited for the plug-in to get ready. And then we did the Atmos mix in Los Angeles in June or so, or July, I can't recall. Gravity itself is, is an unusual film because there was a lot of stuff that we did not because we could, because it is kind of, uh, by nature, kind of untethered. So we did a lot of experimenting with that and it was, it, it worked with the story, so it was really fun and exciting. And it is fun and exciting to see the movie in Atmos because it is kind of untethered and, and it helps you visually and, and um, audio-wise. It helps reinforce and emphasize the lack of stuff holding you down. <laughs> and it also is very disorienting and, and horrifying. It reinforces that aspect as well, which is, which is really cool. And what a great, um, fun adventure it was. Yeah. <laughs> I know you had a long relationship with the facility Sound One, one of the biggest post studios that has ever been in New York City. Uh, I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit about your relationship with Sound One and uh, your thoughts about what happened once it left. New York, there, there aren't any studios here. Uh, in terms of major Hollywood studios, there are some smaller entities here in New York, but um, there are no big Warner Brothers, Disney, etc. So the films that, that kind of grow up here are uh, more individual projects, artistic projects, and uh, filmmaker projects. So there are quite a few filmmakers who live here. Like Darren Aronofsky, for instance, he basically figures out what he wants to do, starts developing it, and gets money. And 
he makes the movie the way he wants to make it, and that's a, that's a common story in New York. In California, it's much more common, from my experience, to have uh, studios have an idea. They get an idea, a book, a play, an idea, and they hire writers, and they make a script, and then they assign director and say, okay, you'll be the director of this project. And then they make the film, and uh, <laughs> there's, there, this is common everywhere. The people who make the script are then remorseful about what the filmmakers make from the script. But those movies are rare in New York. You know, most movies in New York are from, a, from an artist out, rather than from the studio in, sort of. So, Sound One um, was kind of the necessary um, first step for New York to be um, in the same league as the Hollywood studios. And Tadeo, which was here on 54th Street, it was a, um, an interesting first step. Tadeo and Sound One kind of evolved at the same time. Um, Sound One had a kind of a grassroots, um, smaller parts coming together, adding a few parts each year. Tadeo actually borrowed money with the help of the state and built a state-of-the-art studio on 54th Street. And uh, they actually cut a hole in the roof and raised the roof and built a proper big dub stage, which was based on a design from Warner Hollywood. And a lot of great films were mixed there. Um, Apollo 13, for instance, was mixed there. I mixed um, a bunch of movies there, including um, Sleepy Hollow and Shaft and Intolerable Cruelty on the Coen Brothers side, I think. I think we mixed lady killers there. And so that room was did a lot of business for, for a while. And uh, eventually that entire block was torn down and a big building was built. And that studio went away. Uh, one of the hit factory spaces went away, was on that block, and a bunch of other cool stuff went away. But Sound One continued to grow. And uh, they, they were, it was very established. And, Pretty much everything I worked on, we mixed in that facility with Lee Dichter or Tom Fleischman or me and Michael Berry. And so we mixed the Coen Brothers movies there. We mixed um, Scorsese's pictures there. It was, it was a real center. Woody Allen worked there from early on. And um, But it was also, to me, it represented uh, like all the things about New York that I either regretted or was trying to change or trying to have an impact on. And um, it, it um, I wouldn't say it drove me to California, but it made me aware, more aware of California. It made me aware of that there must be a better way or is there a better way. And um, so that led to us moving to California. We, we moved to California and came back. And when we came back is when um, Sound One shut. In fact, when we moved in here to this facility, which was uh, we, being me and Warner Brothers, moved in here, um, Sound One closed like two months later or something. It was a weird coincidence of forces, I guess. But it didn't really matter because I, I really, once I started working as a mixer, I became less entangled with Sound One and um, it became less important where we did it. We started working in California. The Co I mean, we being the Coen brothers, and starting with Oh Brother Where Art Thou, I think was the first one that we mixed at Sony. And there became this kind of weird, um, I think capricious is the right word, where we're all in the same place. The, R Roger Deakins wanted to do the DI to Oh Brother. He wanted to change the colors, and that was a big step forward. And I had moved out there, and uh, the, originally I, I had said to them, whichever, you, I'll come back and work there, or you can come here, how, how, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, they later told me that they were only going out there because I was there. <laughs> and I told them so quite sincerely, I thought, you know, we would mix out there because they w wanted to be there to do this, the DI thing. So for a while there, we, we went back and forth. We'd do some work here and do the final mix there. That, that's fairly 
that that's when we did Lewin Davis and Hale Caesar recently. That's working. That, that's that's a feasible idea. Now we have this facility here with this big stage downstairs. We don't really need to go to Sony to get the big room feel, but I suspect we probably still will go to Sony for you know a few days or a week or something like that to play back and hang out. Well, uh, thank you very much for taking the You're time welcome. to talk to us. It's been really great. <laughs> thank you. Well, there you go. That was Skip. He is amazing. We're saying Skip Livesay. Eh? I asked him at the beginning of the interview how you pronounce his last name, and he gave me like a 10-minute story about how different parts of his family came from different parts of the world and they all pronounce it differently and that when they first arrived in North America they changed the spelling of it and he went on and on and at the end of it I still didn't know exactly how to pronounce his name so we're going to say live say could be love say I'm not 100% sure but uh, I want to thank him for bringing us into uh, WB Sound and uh, being super cool with us and thank Dave the dog for also taking part and Teresa Morrow for uh, running the uh, recorder while we were doing this interview. Uh, thanks to everyone who listens and participates in the show. Thanks to Stacey DuPos for letting us bend and twist her voice on our bumpers. You can follow the show at the Tone Benders and go to ToneBendersPodcast.com to leave a comment. You can support the podcast by shopping at ToneBendersPodcast.com slash Amazon or ToneBendersPodcast.com slash BH. Thanks, Tim. See you next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to Tone Vendors. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. If you listen on iTunes or Stitcher, please write us a review while you're there. To support the show, go to ToneVendorsPodcast.com and click through our Amazon link or leave us a tip. You can also download and listen to our entire show archive there and leave a comment on our site or on SoundCloud. Keep up to date by following at the Tone Vendors on Twitter or find Tone Vendors Podcast on Facebook and YouTube. Email us with your questions and ideas at info at tonevendorspodcast.com.